Hello, everyone. And uh, welcome to our panel on what's missing in the missing middle discussion, uh, planning for inclusionary redevelopment of single family neighborhoods. My name is Jeremy Withers, and I'm going to be hosting the event tonight. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto, and I'm also the outreach coordinator for the Affordable Housing Challenge Project, which is a U of T School of Cities initiative. So our mission at AHCP is to bring together housing scholars with advocates and decision makers to discuss and advance solutions to Toronto's affordable housing crisis. Um, so we're very excited to welcome our, our four panelists tonight uh, and, and all of you in attendance uh, to join us. Um, before we begin this conversation, uh, we need to make an acknowledgement. Um, the subject we're here to address tonight, the displacement and exclusion of lower income communities from large swaths of the city uh, is a very current and pressing issue. But if we look at it from a longer term perspective, we can also see it's a consequence of a longstanding process of plunder and displacement uh, on which in many ways Canada was founded. So the land about which we're speaking today was stolen from the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit, which are communities that, that for countless generations have passed on the lesson that this land ought to be stewarded by all who take part in using it. Uh, it was stolen by white supremacists who divided and subdivided it and sold and resold it to the highest bidders. So today in Ontario, the right to determine how and by whom land is used is still largely denied to the wider communities living on it and granted instead to the highest bidders. And too often what this means is the right to determine who gets to live where and who gets evicted is granted to the wealthiest, often white settlers. So this is true whether we're looking at our province's weak rent controls or the inadequate uh, support provided by all levels of government for the development of new community housing, uh, or as we're talking about today, our city's highly segregated approach to approving new, de new developments. Uh, for which affordability requirements are few and far between. So I hope this acknowledgement will help guide us in thinking through what it means to decolonize Toronto. Uh, and I see that struggle as intrinsically bound up with a struggle to wrestle the control of land use from those settlers who view it simply as a means to inflate their private wealth uh, and to place it in the hands of communities making a home here. So tonight we're going to hear from four experts on a, on a truly timely subject. Uh, for many years, Toronto has been among the fastest growing cities in North America, but our government's approach to producing new housing has led to an increasingly bifurcated city, one in which enormous amounts of high-rise development is concentrated in a few high-density growth hubs, uh, while the vast majority of the city's neighborhoods are left as is, more or less banned from even gentle densification. Over the past decade, Toronto has approved record-breaking amounts of new high-rise housing a boom that's catapulted it into a league of its own among North American state, cities. Uh, astoundingly, last year, it was home to five times more cranes in the sky than any other city in North America. But this intensification is being experienced highly unevenly. Uh, although just under half of Toronto is zoned for residential uses, practically all of this intensification, intensification is being directed towards a few hubs encompassing about 5% of the city's land area. Uh, researchers and advocates have documented the mounting negative outcomes uh, of this segregated pattern of growth. Uh, as John Loring uh, explained in his introduction to an important book on this topic, House Divided, uh, I quote, the enforced stability bestowed on Toronto's house neighborhoods has fueled mounting instability experienced by everyone else. Um, the pattern has left residents in growth hubs such as downtown core and along Young uh, facing increasingly overcrowded, overburdened, overburdened public infrastructure and green space, and mounting difficulties uh, finding multi-bedroom flats, uh, problems that have grown much more acute through the global pandemic. The flip side of this segregated pattern of growth is, uh, in fact, a destabilizing effect on the very neighborhoods it seeks to stabilize. So in recent years, over half of Toronto's low-density house neighborhoods have experienced declines in population as empty nesters and seniors are prevented from finding smaller, more accessible forms of housing to ancient place in their neighborhood. Uh, unsurprisingly, as these neighborhoods' uh, populations decrease, so too does the usage and, to an extent, the viability of local public services and retail strips. Uh, and the consequence is sometimes closures of local businesses, schools, childcare facilities. Um, 
Of course, the, the segregation of built form is also contributing to a segregation of people based on class and social identity. Uh, on the one hand, Toronto's expansive house neighborhoods have become increasingly exclusive bastions for wealthy, established, often older, often white residents. Uh, on the other, Toronto's lower income communities, disproportionately racialized communities, newcomers, immigrants, non-cis identifying communities, they're left to scramble for a small and shrinking stock of units in a few high rise neighborhoods, uh, which are all too often aging apartments in transit poor food deserts. So faced with these challenges, uh, calls have grown for Toronto to finally change its official plan and open these areas up to densel, the gentle densification. You know, in a context of a mounting housing crisis, the arguments in favor of permitting streamlined approvals of missing middle forms of housing, i.e. townhomes, multiplexes, low-rise apartments, uh, maybe even mid-rise, you know, have become difficult to dismiss. Uh, across Canada, calls to end what's often called exclusionary zoning are beginning to generate mass appeal. And far from going unheard, uh, decision makers across the political spectrum appear increasingly to be taking notice. We can see this in the city of Toronto's nascent expanding housing op options in neighborhoods initiative. And we can see it in the recommendations of the much discussed Ontario Housing Task Force appointed by provincial conservatives, uh, which recommended mandating upzoning of single family neighborhoods to allow up to four stories and four units on a single lot. So these potentially imminent policy changes mark a major opportunity for cities like Toronto to reimagine how and for whom we wanna make our neighborhoods. But as we enter this exciting, you know, potentially watershed moment, I think we need to be careful not to simply celebrate uncritically the idea that these neighborhoods should be opened up to densification carte blanche. And instead, as, as many progressive urbanists uh, are arguing, uh, this moment should focus our minds on answering how exactly these neighborhoods could be opened up to densification, which is inclusionary. So we can ensure these neighborhoods are made more accessible to a broader mix of communities and incomes. As we'll hear tonight from some of our panelists, there's a, there's a real risk that if the approval of new multi-unit housing doesn't come tied with carefully calibrated affordability requirements, we may simply be opening up our neighborhoods to a new wave of exclusionary high-priced housing. And certainly this outcome would be more than welcome to the financiers and developers who largely make up, for example, the Ontario Housing Task Force. Um, so experience in a wide range of cities, however, suggests there are ways to prevent such an outcome. Uh, as we'll discuss in many single family neighborhoods across North America, cities are finding creative ways to ensure the benefits of redevelopment are shared more broadly. Uh, they're doing so by requiring a certain amount of the new units created are affordable to low and middle income residents. Uh, rather than simply allowing the new units to be sold to the highest bidder and then allowing all the consequent huge increases of land value to be captured by their city's wealthiest, cities are learning to make more nuanced planning decisions to capture some of this value to serve a social need or to work with nonprofit developers um, to, to ensure those maintain uh, and maintains the affordability of these uh, redeveloped sites. Um, so the central question we ask, we seek to address on tonight's panel is how can cities ensure a substantial portion of the new missing middle housing approved in such neighborhoods are affordable to middle and lower income residents? Is this possible? And if so, how? Uh, and furthermore, how can we make sure the redevelopment of single family neighborhoods is inclusionary and doesn't lead to a net loss of existing uh, affordable housing for, you know, for low income tenants to protect these tenants. Um, so tonight we'll be hearing from four fantastic panelists, uh, Professor Patrick Condon, uh, Melissa Goldstein, uh, Councillor Gord Perks, and finally uh, Marcel Gros. Uh, so each of our panelists will be presenting, presenting for kind of 10 to 15 minutes. And after they're all finished, we're gonna spend the remainder of our time uh, that is in, until 9 p.m. If, if, we, if we get there, fielding questions and opening up discussion among our panelists. So please feel free to write questions in the text box as they come to you. Uh, and I'll do my best to raise them to our panelists uh, later in the evening. Um, so without further ado, um, I want to introduce um, our first panelist, Melissa Goldstein. Uh, she's a, an affordable housing policy researcher and advocate. 
uh, currently working on advancing missing middle housing solutions uh, with the city of Brampton. Uh, and she'll be providing uh, an overview of a number of recent uh, inclusionary missing middle policies uh, implemented by cities in the US, uh, which may hold lessons for the GTA. Um, so, uh, so please, uh, Melissa, take the, uh, take the floor. Oh, so hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Um, I wanted to start uh, this conversation by arguing that the key thing that's missing from this conversation about upzoning single family zones is empirical evidence. Empirical evidence that based on the evaluations of the impact of different approaches to upzoning that have been implemented to date. Different upzoning methods are being implemented in cities around the globe, but the conversation is still largely premised on opinion and untested assumptions. The City of Toronto undertook a jurisdictional review of a few jurisdictions in its effort um, in its expanding neighborhood options uh, initiative, but it only looked at the features of the zoning changes in other places, not at the effect that those zoning changes had. And while I recognize the challenges with accessing adequate data and the complicated dynamics involved in each jurisdiction that makes, eva makes evaluation challenging, in many places, there's a lot of data available. And I have some slides that show some of these data sources. And if there's time, I can show you them. Um, and there's a lot of data that could be available if municipalities work to track their, their uh, data better or their like housing data better. And in doing like a literature review of, of the evidence out there, what I found is that, is that there is an overwhelming lack of effort made to evaluate the impacts of upzoning. Um, and especially, which is especially troubling um, because there isn't anybody looking to see what the impacts are for the purposes of improving land use planning and addressing housing and affordability by municipalities. Uh, and that's, an, um, that's lacking from municipalities, from planning researchers and the academic community altogether. And it's just stunning, the, the, the lack of uh, research that's being done. Sorry. And what's interesting is that there are a lot of issues that are missing from the conversation, but they're not missing from the city's expanding housing options and neighborhoods report. They explicitly ask, like, what's the what what impact will increased housing options have on supply, and how many new homes might be expected over specific timelines? They ask about affordability, whether efforts to increase the supply of missing middle type housing will result in more affordable living accommodations. Will additional planning permissions drive up land prices higher? They ask about whether this will Im improve equity and economic inclusion in single family home neighborhoods. Uh, but instead of trying to answer any of these questions, the cities just move forward with developing proposals that ignore these questions altogether. And this is a problem because while advocates for upzoning the Yellow Belt say it'll increase, e increase housing supply enough to improve housing affordability so that single family zoned areas become accessible to the people commonly excluded from these areas, namely low income and BIPOC people, thereby improving racial and economic equity. The reality is that upzoning has produced very little supply in areas where it's been implemented, and it may actually function to inflate property values, especially the values of the most affordable single family homes, worsening housing affordability, which would then set the stage for the redevelopment of the most affordable single family homes with and replacing them with high end units not subject to rent control, and also result in the displacement of low to mid-income tenants from the single-family home zones who currently occupy these more affordable homes. And so I, in the research that I've been doing, I was looking for evidence. What has been happening in areas, like we've heard a lot about um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, what has the upzoning in that area um, achieved and then what's been achieved in other, in other places. So in Minneapolis specifically, uh, what they did was they had the blanket upzoning of single family home areas. Those areas already allowed one accessory dwelling unit per single family lot. And they now allow up to three units plus one accessory dwelling unit per lot. And they didn't um, allow any increases in building size. So that's within the same building envelope but they did reduce parking requirements. And that's been in effect since January 1st, 2020. And what that's produced to date, so that's uh, 
but two years roughly, right? And so what that's produced to date is 31 duplexes and 14 triplexes on single family zone lots, which is an addition of 59 units to the housing supply. Um, in addition, I also found uh, evidence that 150 accessory dwelling units were permitted since 2014. And at the same time, early research, this is one study uh, that was done on the impact on property values found that upzoning was associated with a three to 5% increase in the price of affected housing units. So that's all housing and single family home zones. And that the price increases were larger in inexpensive neighborhoods and for properties that are small relative to their immediate neighbors. And so the question there is, uh, is this a success story and is this, uh, does this change the story for people who think that upzoning uh, the yellow belt is going to, to bring some sort of uh, solution to the housing crisis? Now, Minneapolis, when, when they implemented uh, their upzoning, they didn't include any affordability uh, requirements. And so other municipalities have actually taken, the conversation in the US is much different than, than here. And there, there've been a lot, there's been a lot more concern about affordable housing and the impact of tenants and low-income tenants and people of color in particular. And so in a lot of cities, they're uh, introducing different types of upzoning that are conditional. So basically increased uh, density is, is conditional on the provision of affordable housing specifically. So one of these examples is in Austin, Texas, where they, and, and they use different mechanisms too. So, in Minneapolis, it was through zoning. In Austin, Texas, it's through a density bonusing program. Their program applies citywide, but for single family home zones, it permits as of right up to eight units per lot in exchange for 50 to 75% of the units being affordable rental or affordable home ownership. And it increases the allowable density with increases in affordability. So it's up to six units, uh, if you have a significant increase in, so that meaning like it's much the, sorry, the uh, depth of affordability is significantly more, uh, the affordability period is significantly longer than you're allowed up to eight units per lot. And to date, 64 projects with a total of 5,989 units, 4,381 of them are affordable have been completed and that's citywide and that's not single family home zones. Of those projects, 25 are in single family home zones and they will add a total of 60 units, 55 of which will be affordable. And so this program, and this is what uh, I'll show you another example too, shows that this kind of upzoning can be effective in allowing affordable housing to be produced, which is difficult to produce at, uh, at present in a lot of places, like forget about single family home zones, but anywhere in the city. And so this can make it a lot easier and cheaper and especially when combined with other uh, incentive programs, which Austin has available in most of the develop of developments of these uh, 64 projects took advantage of those incentives. So Cambridge, Massachusetts use an affordable housing overlay. And what that does is it doesn't change the base zoning of the land, but for affordable units, it allows single fit single. So if your units are affordable, it will allow you to build two family detached dwellings, townhouses, multifamily dwellings up to four stories high with no minimum lot size per dwelling and no off street parking requirements. And that's been in effect since 2020. And there's not that much data that's available that looks, it's again, it's citywide and it does, the data that's available doesn't separate out um, single family homes areas, what it looks at is large scale projects. And so of the large scale projects, 400 additional affordable homes are in the development pipeline. And there isn't any data that I could find that talks about what the effect has been in single family home zones. And then in Portland, the residential infill project zoning allows for four market rate units or up to six units of half of the units overall are affordable in single family zones. And that's an increase from two dwelling units per lot and it, they also waive parking requirements in most areas. They, and the thing that I think is innovative about this idea is that they also reduce the maximum size of single family homes while scaling up the allowable building size um, with increases in the number of units. So what that does is it disincentivizes somebody from building a new single family home or, or bigger ones. I mean, and that's something that we've seen everywhere, right? Where a smaller single family home is is purchased and redeveloped into something much bigger. And so 
Portland is making that uh, less possible, and but you can be rewarded making a bigger home if it's multiple units. Uh, but again, there's no data on what the effect has been so far. And there's no shortage of places to investigate. There's a lot of research around New York. I just didn't have time to look at all of it. Um, I think there's some data around BC, but we've also seen uh, upzoning in Chicago, Seattle, Atlanta, California, Auckland, New Zealand, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Switzerland, Australia. Um, and actually, I should also add that the state of California has been working to promote accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units, or also called lock-off units in the state. And research on that's found that um, not many units are produced without a lot of effort and a lot of incentives. And I look specifically at um, a number of incentive programs to produce affordable ADUs specifically. And what I found is that these are really short-term initiatives and their targets are only like up to four units, like four, four units. And once the uh, money runs out, and there's basically like $50,000 per unit, and once the money runs out, the program ends. And they also don't, even with the incentives, the affordability periods are only five to 20 years long. And so they really don't produce that much housing. And so the big takeaway here, and this is generally uncontested in everything that I've been reading, is that upzoning single family zones only produces a small number of additional units, no more than what would be produced through the construction of a single low rise multi-unit building. Um, Minneapolis produced twice as many units as Austin, but none of them were affordable, and most of Austin's were. And meanwhile, there's evidence that property values in Minneapolis have increased as a result of the upzoning, especially in low-income and more racialized neighborhoods. And while in theory, Austin's density bonusing program shouldn't have had much or any influence on property values, I haven't seen anyone look into that. And I have done research yet myself. But People looking to upzoning Yellow Belt to produce the hundreds of thousands of units that some say that we need are going to be disappointed. That's what I wanted to get across, is that that's not what this initiative will do. And then I will leave it to the next person. Well, thanks so much, Melissa. Um, we're, um, I think we're gonna move on to, um, we're gonna move on to Councillor Gord Perks to take a bit more of a local perspective on this question. Um, so um, Councillor Gord Perks is the Councillor for Parkdale High Park. Uh, he's also a member of the city's planning and housing committee. Um, so I, I wanna welcome you to the board Councillor, and thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, unlike Melissa, I, I don't have a slideshow, so. I'm just a, a poor elected official. I don't have time to, to prepare. Uh, am, am I coming through? Yes. Uh, okay. I don't have time to prepare uh, elaborate presentations, sorry. So um, what I'd like to do with my time is to talk about <clears throat> three, three pieces of history, recent history that led to uh, where we are now. I want to talk about this as a political moment, not an economic moment. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the myths around missing middle. And I want to propose maybe a path out for us to truly address some of our housing problems. So the first piece of history that I think is relevant here uh, goes to the uh, economic and uh, debt crisis, if you will, of the late 90s. Uh, if you recall, Paul Martin was the Minister of Finance. Uh, Mike Harris uh, was very was on the way to becoming Premier of Ontario. Uh, and there were arguments being made that, the, that Canada had so much debt that our dollar was going to collapse and uh, everything was gonna be terrible. Um, you would see members of uh, federal and provincial cabinet giving speeches and they would have behind them a display board that showed how much the deficit at the federal level was growing every day. The, the conversation was very much about uh, inflation, it was about uh, affordability. It was 
about economic stability. And the, what, what the federal government did was to absent itself uh, through a pro program of austerity from a number of different places where they used to provide money. Uh, they used to fund uh, part of post-secondary education. They got out of that entirely. But more germane to our conversation tonight, they simply stopped contributing to the construction of social housing altogether. Uh, not long after that, the province of Ontario under Mike Harris uh, stopped its contribution to social housing and in fact downloaded uh, housing that they had constructed onto local municipalities. They downloaded it, by the way, uh, without giving us any uh, building repair funds. Normally, if you own a building every year, you sock away a little bit of money so that when the roof leaks or the boiler breaks, uh, it's prepaid and you can manage it. So we had a circumstance where uh, the city of Toronto and other municipalities suddenly stopped having any access to uh, creating new social housing. And if you look at that social housing starts you can see the late 90s, they, they just fall off a cliff and we lose a whole generation of social housing construction in Toronto and, and elsewhere in Canada. And this has, you know, a number of, of effects. One, uh, the number of people who uh, were, were homeless or struggling to be housed at all grew dramatically continues to grow to this day. We currently have something like 11,000 homeless people in the city of Toronto. Uh, households that uh, were struggling, but managed to hang on, are now paying 50, 60% of their income on, uh, on housing, which is probably twice what they should be paying. And, uh, it also created a, a, a change in, in the mindset. Housing, public housing, uh, social housing became viewed as only housing for people who couldn't afford housing otherwise. In other words, it became housing for uh, extremely low income people. And it also became crime ridden and dangerous and badly constructed. We also lost uh, all the capacity within governments, uh, public housing companies, not-for-profits and co-ops to know how to build. And this is a bigger deal than, than most people uh, understand. I've been working on some social housing programs uh, in the ward I represent. And the problem is finding somebody who knows how to develop a good business case raise the necessary finances, get the development approvals, hire an architect and construct something. It has literally been uh, several years of trying to recruit and find and train people who have those skills. So that's the first piece of history. They, oh, the other, the other consequence, of course, is that uh, the public doesn't understand uh, that social housing could be an option for the middle class. And as a, as a result, they don't see social housing as for them. They see it only for people with very low incomes and don't see a role for it in solving some of the problems we're facing right now with housing affordability. The other piece of recent history that I think we should bear in mind is the moment of the Occupy movement. Remember, we are the 99%. And Part of why that moment happened is uh, all over North America and frankly, globally, uh, neoliberal approaches to government meant that things like uh, income supports for people who were out of work or had a disability were dramatically cut. Uh, right now, the levels that of the level, the amount of money you get on Ontario Works or the Ontario Disability Support Program is less than, less than the average market rent. In other words, you would have to spend 120% or 130% of your income to be housed if you're on those programs. It also meant that uh, wages and salaries uh, faced enormous down, downward pressure through those periods of austerity and uh, 
the elimination of labor protections, the uh, dramatic loss, uh, shrinkage of unionized workers as a percentage of the uh, total employment base. Uh, a couple of years ago, both Canada and the United States were at the lowest uh, union participation rate since the 1910s. Uh, what this means is that the wealth we were generating as a society was not going to people who worked and their capacity to pay for housing diminished. We all have less income, we all have a harder time paying for housing. But the money didn't disappear, it went to uh, wealthy people and wealthy people began to invest it. And, you know, accounts vary, but something like 70% of all wealth in the world is tied up in real estate. So you had a moment where the ability of people to pay for housing is shrinking and the number of dollars chasing real estate was growing and inflating their cost. And that's part of why you had that, that moment that we think of as Occupy, which was framed as a, uh, an argument between the 1% and the 99%. I think that the political formation we're in right now, where people are arguing that the solution to housing problems is to, uh, reduce the amount of planning control, to deregulate planning control, frankly, uh, is really an argument between the 1% and the 20%. And the other 80% of us are still being left out because the market approach to housing will never produce housing for the overwhelming majority of Torontonians and Canadians. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The third thing that is sort of foundational to the politics of this moment is uh, the very, very interesting battles we had around urban sprawl in the 80s and 90s, following a period, the post-war boom, uh, where we were building single family homes on farmland at a record pace all over North America, and particularly here in, in Greater Toronto. Uh, there, there came a moment when a number of uh, segments of society came together and said, my God, this is disastrous. It's polluting. It's consuming our farmland. It's leading to a very poor quality of life. It's, it's leading to enormous commute times. It's killing our transit system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you had a moment in Ontario and in Toronto in particular, where uh, a coalition of, of disparate interests in our society came together and argued that we needed to re-urbanize. The coalition included environmentalists. It included people in the suburbs who had bought thinking that their backyard was going to look, look out onto nature, onto a ravine, and suddenly discovered that no, the, that was just becoming the next subdivision, and then the subdivision after that. People forget, but uh, an awful lot of the political momentum that led to some of our existing planning controls and, and environmental protections came from people in the suburbs, in Richmond Hill, in Markham, uh, right across what we call the 905 now. They and uh, leftists and downtown urbanists and the Jane Jacobs sort of school of planning people uh, all came together and formed a political uh, pact, informal though it may have been, which led to uh, some very progressive work, even coming from fairly right-wing governments. Uh, it led to uh, the green belt being protected. It led to uh, plans, or, uh, municipal uh, plans which said, uh, we are going to re-urbanize and increase density in already built up areas. It led to a very lively conversation about compact urban form and the livability of the places we're in and transit oriented development. If you go through uh, 
Ontario government documents or local municipal government documents from that period in the late 80s and the late 90s, you will find uh, documents from uh, the provincial government, even when Mike Harris was premier, uh, creating guidebooks for how developments should organize so that they're transit supportive. There was this coalition that existed around urbanism. Uh, flash forward to today, and that coalition is now split. It's split three ways. It's split between uh, the so-called market urbanists who are in many ways related to the people who uh, read Jane Jacobs uh, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, it contains a, a faction which is the people who managed to hang on in the suburbs, even while their incomes were dropping in homes and are now uh, finally uh, able to think to themselves that they're reasonably wealthy. And then finally, there are those of us uh, who are thinking about housing uh, from a social, in a social way, thinking that the solutions need to include people in the lowest three quintiles of income. And we form three distinct camps. I think our, our task has to be to form a new coalition that says uh, municipalities, cities, the places we live need to be, as we used to argue, livable, they need to be sustainable, and they need to be affordable. And that that takes uh, government-led action. It takes regulation, it takes public investment. And we need to push back against what is essentially uh, from the market urbanists, a deregulation argument. They're saying that we need to remove planning controls. They're saying also that we need to remove the fees and charges associated with the development of new units. If, and I'll come to that in a moment. So with that structure in mind, let's take a, a moment to look at the missing middle argument and see how it holds up against that new conception livable, sustainable, and affordable. All three are necessary. You can't have a, a decent place to live if you only get su succeed in achieving two of those. Um, the missing middle, as Melissa demonstrated with data, the approaches, the deregulatory approaches to the missing middle, uh, allowing more units per property and more, uh, you know, townhouses, uh, walk-up apartments, garden suites, laneway suites, that approach. If you talk frankly with anyone from the City of Toronto Planning Department who's working on this, they will tell you that the evidence we've seen from our laneway housing program and the evidence that they're observing, just like Melissa said, shows that this kind of deregulation inside the stable neighborhoods will yield very few units. It will yield hundreds per year, hundreds. We currently are uh, facing pressure to house tens of thousands of households every year. So it's like 1%, 2%, maybe 5%, 10% if you're lucky of the necessary supply. Second, the units that this produces are in no way affordable. Uh, where they are things like garden suites or rooming houses, the, or it's not rooming houses, excuse me, uh, garden suites or laneway suites, the rents we're seeing are 2,500 to 3,000 a month. That is outside the reach of 80% of Torontonians if you look at their incomes. So you're, you're building housing, as I said a moment ago, for the 20%. The other thing that uh, they argue is that, well, if you just take all the fees and charges that the city char puts on these units, then they become affordable. Again, a deregulation argument. The city of Toronto collects something called development charges, and there are a few others. Uh, there's a community development charge at, it used to be called Section 37 of the Planning Act, and there's a park, park dedication levy. 
we are required by law to forecast 10 and 20 years out what the growth related infrastructure costs will be. If the population goes up, how many new childcare centers do we need? How many new buses do we have to buy? How many fire trucks do we have to buy? How many, how much uh, new, how many kilometers of new uh, heavy rail subway or light rail transit do we have to build? And it's a very rigorous third party assessment. And the projection that we've got is <clears throat> the growth related capital costs, only capital costs that the city of Toronto faces in the next decade are on the order of 2.8, 2.9 billion. The forecast for what we will actually collect in development charges and those other fees that I talked about is on the order of about 750 million a year, or sorry, 750 million. So you can see it's not even a quarter of the costs that uh, will be required. So the, the argument that we should stop charging further impoverishes the city to provide the services that help people afford to live in Toronto. If we can't build childcare spaces, if we can't uh, buy buses, if we can't make transit, the costs that uh, are borne by individual households go up. Almost all of the services that the city of Toronto provides are net economic po positive to the overwhelming majority of Torontonians. If we can't provide those services, they have to make up for it with an already overtaxed household budget. So we know that the deregulation agenda won't work. We know that the political formation that is arguing for the deregulated approach to housing, the, the missing middle, uh, uh, YIMBY approach will only serve a very, very small number of people. It, and it will, as Melissa said, fail to serve the overwhelming majority of Torontonians. We need to make a, a case collectively that we need a housing strategy similar to municipalities around the world who have recognized that the private market cannot and will never uh, provide housing for the majority of people in our city, that we need a renewed and reinvigorated investment in social housing. If you tie social housing to some of the claims about uh, the lack of density around transit stations and the missing middle and so on, there's a path where we can have that cake and eat it too, where instead of turning households, uh, single family dwelling households into speculative commodities in order to house one extra household. If instead we said we want a social ownership approach so that we can uh, build those walk ups and so on, but take them out of the speculative market so that the only only thing it's paying for is the housing cost, not the return on investment to the financiers behind the, the developers, then there may be a way where we can rebuild the coalition that existed in the 80s and 90s and have a path forward where the vision of a Toronto that is sustainable, livable and affordable can be achieved. Uh, Jeremy, with that, I'll conclude my remarks and I look forward to the questions and the other panelists. Thanks so much, Gord. Um, so we're going to move now to, uh, to Patrick Condon. Um, Patrick Condon is a professor at uh, UBC's School of Architecture and, uh, and Landscape Architecture, and he's a, a former city planner. Um, um, and he's based in Vancouver, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, about how Vancouver is, uh, is, facing these, uh, is facing these challenges and the extent to which um, this purported solution is, uh, is uh, is viable there to, to meet those challenges. Patrick, please take the floor. Yes, uh, I'm happy to do so. And hello, everybody. And since 
Melissa and Gordon have done just an excellent job of setting things up. It may provide the opportunity for me to be briefer than I typically am. So I will end up focusing on just one issue that in my experience is often underappreciated and that's the price of land, urban land available for the missing middle. And I'll try to keep my focus on the missing middle in, a, in these comments. Uh, I've lived in Vancouver for 30 odd years. And when I moved there, I came to a missing middle paradise. It's called Kitsilano. It's halfway between UBC and downtown. It's a classic streetcar neighborhood. It's much like the beaches in Toronto, and you have many examples of this same kind of neighborhood, where uh, because it uh, largely grew before the advent of very restrictive zoning, you find a lot of diversity in the fabric. And even though most of it looks like a single family neighborhood, it's actually fairly high density at 17 dwelling units per acre which in my research and the research of others is, is a very sustainable density because it's very supportive of neighbor, neighborhood commercial. It's very supportive of transit use, very high transit use in the neighborhood, very, very low car use and so forth and so on. So I do understand the value of missing middle neighborhoods that depart from the, the paradigm of single family homes on a cul-de-sac where there's absolutely no place to walk and there's no bus service and what bus service there is comes once every hour and only during rush hour and so forth. So that's in the way of introduction about who I am and where I am and uh, what has influenced my thinking about this in, in my work. <clears throat> and for decades, uh, my work was really making the case that all neighborhoods should be like this. I loved it so much. I felt that all neighborhoods should be like this, you know, somewhere between 10 and 25 dwelling units per acre. You don't need high rises. Make sure you mix in uh, apartment units for the, for the college students in the same building as a family of four and so forth and so on. And everything's within a five minute walking distance of commercial services and transit, just a wonderful way to live and plenty of recreational space as well. And it was my presumption that uh, that doing that would lead to affordability because it makes intuitive sense. If you add new housing units to a neighborhood, uh, that's got to make uh, things more affordable because it's just the law of supply and demand, right? You, you add additional supply to a particular area that there is demand and therefore the prices should go down. And I believe that very, very deeply. Unfortunately, as you can tell by my gray hair, uh, I've had a number of decades of actually observing the phenomenon in Vancouver and have been extremely disappointed to realize that over the course of those 30 years, Vancouver has done more than any other North American community, and that includes Toronto, the older parts of Toronto for sure, the original Toronto. The city of Vancouver has done more than any other center city area uh, in North America to expand its, to expand its uh, housing, not the number of housing units by 60% over the course of the period between 1985 and now. No other center city metropolitan city has done that in North America. So if the supply and demand argument about adding supply to missing middle neighborhoods was true, you would expect housing in Vancouver to be the cheapest of any place in North America. And as probably everybody on this call knows that housing in Vancouver is the most expensive in North America when measured against average incomes. When measured against average incomes, housing in Vancouver is more expensive than Toronto. It's more expensive than Los Angeles. It's more expensive than Washington, DC. It's more expensive than Seattle. And it's even more expensive than San Francisco. So yeah, you know, I'm an academic. I'm interested in evidence. And the empirical evidence that I was observing forced me to reluctantly conclude that Adding 
missing middle density is a really good thing to do for a lot of good reasons. It creates housing units that are smaller or larger or medium sizes for very different demographics. It creates opportunities for the elderly to stay in their neighborhoods and age in place. It creates a much more vibrant street scene on the commercial arterials. And it provides pedestrian clients for, for a sustainable transit system. All those things are true. And for that reason, missing middle should proceed in any location. But those who are arguing, as most are now, I find, that adding that, that new density will lead to more affordability, I'm afraid we'll be very disappointed. Now, of course, that raises in all of our minds and in your minds, well, if adding supply is not the answer to this problem, if that's the, not the derivation, that's not neither the solution nor the derivation of this uh, problem, it's not a constraint issue, it's not a supply issue. What is the problem here? And so I spent the last 10 years of investigation trying to answer that question sufficiently for myself. And so I'm here to offer you tonight my answer to that question. The question, which is very seldom discussed in these conversations, has to do with the way land, urban land in particular, has a unique ability to absorb all the value that we as citizens and as public officials put into the building of a great city. No matter how much effort we put into the building of that great city by keeping our, keeping our lawns mowed, and our city councilors who will do the right thing and create the daycare centers and all that other stuff, that, that human capital and capital capital, civic capital, ends up being almost to the penny absorbed in the value of land, in the market value of land. And the more uh, capital value we put on top of that dirt, and that's what the missing middle is doing, by suggesting we're gonna put a whole bunch of new units on top of these single family homes. The more capital value we put on top of that dirt, the more valuable the dirt becomes. That's very simple fourth grade mathematics and it's very true. And it's surprising to me how little that basic and accessible and understandable point becomes the centerpiece of the argument around the missing middle. The unfortunate fact is that when we add density allowance, into our neighborhoods. The reaction of the market is to increase the land value prices up to a level that corresponds with the new increase that the city has allowed. It's a great conundrum because the thing we want to do to enhance affordability for the renter or for the buyer ends up putting money in the already overstuffed pockets of the land speculators. So those of you listening who are not interested in this as a social issue, who are, who are really interested in making a lot of money should really immediately, starting on Monday, change your profession and go into the land speculation game because that's really, as, as uh, the counselor has said and, and uh, others have said tonight, 75% of the capital value, investment value in the world is going into land value these days. So you should get a piece of that game because that's really where the money is to be made. For those of you who are not gonna make that career change, it's important to recognize that our collective efforts at making the city a better place to live and neighborhoods a better place to be with missing middle additional density are enriching the land speculators first and foremost with only marginal and perhaps negative uh, enhancement of the social benefits of affordability and neighborhood quality that we are hoping to engender through our collective efforts. So what are we gonna do? Uh, I would say that like Melissa says, a simple way of thinking about this is let's not add new density without insisting on affordability because that will hold down the land value and make it possible for projects to pencil out 
in a way that can allow some or all of that new housing units to be permanently affordable. Melissa mentioned both uh, Cambridge and Portland. I'll speak to Cambridge and speak specifically how it's sophisticated in understanding the issue of land value. Because in Cambridge, they have said, go ahead and build your single family home if you want to. Or if you're in a fourplex zone, go ahead and build your fourplex. We're not going to change the zoning in our city at all. We're just going to put this overlay across the whole bloody city that says, if you are willing to create a 100% affordable housing project, we will allow you to double the density of that project. Why does that matter to land value? Let's say a parcel costs a million dollars. Under ordinary circumstances, you, you double the density for missing middle, it goes up to $2 million right away. That's just the way the market works. However, in the Cambridge example, you say you can double the density, but only if you, if you allow 100% affordability. Then the nonprofit providers, which are the most usual people who take advantage of this opportunity, will go to that parcel owner and say, I can give you, I can afford a million dollars for this parcel. And the parcel owner will say, I thought you were going to get double density. I thought I could get double the money on this parcel. And the, the, the nonprofit provider would say, I'm sorry, Joe, I can only offer you a million dollars because the return on my investment based on these affordable rentals is only sufficient to amortize uh, the mortgage for my building costs and my maintenance costs and your land such that the residual value of your land based on what I've penciled out is, is still a million dollars. So go ahead and sell it for the single family home if you want to, but I'm, I'm ready to give you cash today if you're willing to sell me that land. So the landowner hasn't lost anything. The community has gained quite a bit because the affordable housing for their service workers and their sons and daughters, which in the case of Vancouver, are there's a massive exodus of our sons and daughters away from our city because it's blatantly unaffordable. That will be prevented in this circumstance because affordable housing will be created. And if in a utopian world where there was enough of this affordable housing, and remember this is permanently affordable housing produced, uh, put out there by nonprofit organizations who have housing agreements with the city that insist on infinite number of decades of affordability as a condition of their approval. And that affordability is based on average household incomes in the city. So the rents only ratchet up when the uh, when basic incomes, when average incomes also ratchet, ratchet up, which ties the home price value per month to your income per month in perpetuity. These are important features of the Cambridge plan that I think are fundamental. And while I agree with the counselor that we should have much more federal and provincial money coming in to support definitely the, pot, the bottom 20%, the bottom quintile of our income for who for various reasons need support that even what I'm proposing could not reach. The middle three quintiles can be accommodated in the market without the necessity of public taxpayer dollars to make that happen because that value is value that would have gone into the land speculators pockets, which is prevented from that destination because the process that I'm talking about uh, stabilizes land values and streams what would otherwise have been land value increases consequent to increased density towards the social benefit that we all want for our sons and daughters and for the service workers who are necessary to keep our communities running. Now, I know that has come across as a bit of a harangue and I might've gone a minute or two longer than I wanted to, 
but I hope that you will remember the fundamental issue that the problem and the solution is to be found in the value, the excessive value in some circumstances of our urban land. And the value of that urban land is not the function of somebody who owned the land doing a lot with it. The value of that land is a function of all of us creating a great city, particularly our, our public officials, right down to the person who mows their lawn and keeps their hedges uh, clipped. That's where the value of that land parcel is coming from. So let us never forget that the community cr creates that value. That, com that value should in large part stream back to, com to community uh, benefits. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope it's made a little bit of sense. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, so we're going to move on now to our, our, our final panelist, uh, Marcel Grove. Um, so Marcel uh, is the founder and CEO for Affordably, I hope I, I pronounced that correctly, um, a co-buying and co-resident FinTech enabled marketplace addressing the housing affordability crisis. Uh, and Marcel has also serves as an advisor for Partner Housing. Um, right, before I right before Marcel takes over, I'll, I'll just remind everyone, um, if, if you have questions that, uh, that, that, that come to mind that you want to, to type out, please, uh, you know, please do so. And then once Marcel is done, we're gonna open, uh, open it up to, uh, to a discussion. Uh, so please take the floor, Marcel. Perfect, excellent. All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, having me on today. Um, I, uh, I stepped in on, on behalf of a friend of mine um, uh, that runs CP Planning, Cheryl, Cheryl Case. And um, so I, I may have a bit of a contrarian view to some of the other speakers here. Um, I will be speaking from my experience of, uh, of creating this type of product. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm sought after in the market, as well as um, looking at innovative ways to to address the affordability, um, the affordability crisis that we're currently going through. So um, that that's going to be kind of the approach we're going we're going to take. So um, just as far as introduction, I, I I ran a company called Garrison prior to affordably ran a company called Garrison um, Asset Management. What we did was a we were a real estate asset management company um, that managed both private mortgage um, financing as well as we were really good at um, um, going through um, the redevelopment process to create um, properties. So we're quite familiar with, with what it takes and we, we've got some real examples of, uh, of something I haven't heard yet, but one of, one of the things that we experienced firsthand um, from a unit economic standpoint is the time that it takes to create these units. Um, no one's really touched on that. And um, there, there's some, there's some real savings that, that, that can happen here um, with, uh, with, with the approach of, of upzoning. So um, we'll, as we'll, we'll go through and I'll, I'll talk to some of the examples that are more specific. Um, so just a little bit about Affordably before we get into this, I'm, I'm not gonna get too deep into this, but Affordably, like we're, we're passionate about solving um, afford affordability for, for um, ownership. Um, we wanna create ownership and um, one of the things we've seen and we've spoken to people is, you know, there's a high barrier of entry, you know, with respect to down payment and financing um, as, as one of the primary challenges to ownership. So how do we create a market solution around afford, um, housing affordability um, that would create value for both developers and investors while reducing barriers of entry for consumers and home buyers? Um, so affordably um, basically addresses that by um, looking at a co-buying and, and co-resident kind of fintech-enabled marketplace, um, addressing affordability um, for young professionals and other such demographics that we're currently getting into and speaking to and understanding um, as we go through. Um, today, I'm here more to speak more about um, Partna, so we're not going to get too deep into the, into affordability, into affordably, but happy to take any any um, any questions um, on that um, in the Q and A. So where are we at today with, with respect to the missing middle? Um, I'll just take you through this quickly. Um, this may be a lot of information that people already know. 
Um, but the higher density buildings are only really available to be developed in, in areas that are designated as mixed use and apartment neighborhoods. Um, so the majority of the, of the neighborhoods in, in the city fall under this, what's called this yellow belt um, or neighborhoods. Um, so the good news is the yellow belt allows for a variety of housing typologies. Um, and we do not need to drastically change land control instruments. Um, you know, simply opening up the residential detached zones, so the RD zones, um, would be a good place to start. So we are, um, we are definitely pro um, uh, missing middle. Um, and this could be accomplished by, you know, allowing what's typically done in other zones um, to, to, to be done the, in, the, in the same way, you know, as, as in the RD zones. Um, so doing so creates uh, what we call a gentle density. A number of people spoke about that already. Um, and, um, and this is this can be sprinkled within neighborhoods, or it can be or it can be done on you know um, corners and on, on major avenues. Now, now what I will say in certain neighborhoods, um, you know, with, with respect to valuation, um, it's it's not necessarily um, true that uh, multi units would be worth as much as single family zone single family homes. Um, especially if those multifamilies were done in the case of the bottom example, where they're located along major avenues. Um, and, we, and we've seen this um, directly in, in, a, in a number of neighborhoods across the city. So that, um, the, the argument around land is not necessarily true um, when it comes to spe very specific neighborhoods. Real estate is a very local business. Um, and, it, and, it, and it happens and it's, and it's treated differently depending on the neighborhood that you're at um, or the neighborhood that you're, you're within or, or a, a, a myriad of other um, very complex and variable um, uh, circumstances. So um, it's, not a, um, it's not a linear um, function, um, unfortunately, so it's not that easy. Um, so what we, what we see now is um, you know, a homeowner can simply tear down a, a bungalow and put up a, a 3,000 square, 3,500 square foot home, which is an example on the left here. Um, uh, the same structure argument, the same structure should be allowed to to do that for a, um, a multifamily building. Now, I will I will agree with a, a number of my other colleagues um, that spoke earlier that we we do need to put certain measures and 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 um, and, and parameters around this. Um, one of the unintended consequences, which I didn't hear anyone speak about, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it. And this is kind of, you know this if you're quote unquote in the streets is what's happening with a lot of these, um, these, these um, multi-units now is um, investors in order to make these, the numbers or the unit economics work will go in, they'll renovate these things. And then what they'll do is they'll, because the, the cost of the, of the building is so expensive and the cost of renovations and the, the time to get your permits is so long, um, they, they turn now to furnish suites in Airbnb. And I think one of my other colleagues mentioned, you know, I've seen basement apartments going for $3,000. So there's an unattended consequence that's currently occurring um, in the Mississippi Middle just because um, investors are so desperate to find yield um, and, and, and projects. So I, would, I do agree that we, we have to Think carefully about this and, and put certain measures in place um, when, when we're allowing um, or if we do decide to allow this upzoning. Now, what I do want to speak a bit more about is the, the time that it's taken. Um, and this is a real example of, 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 of what our company um, went through. On the left, we, we purchased a semi-detached, um, dilapidated home in, in, in the neighborhood downtown Toronto. Um, and we were able to create um, two legal units, so a duplex, um, in about, um, call it 14 months. Not too bad, that's because it's only, we were just adding a, a, um, a basement apartment, a legal basement apartment in that case. Um, so not too bad, the, the, the time was, was relatively quick. On the, on the right-hand side, we, we, we acquired a property on a, on a corner and looked to create this townhouse project. Five years later, um, you know, approvals came in. Um, when I first ran the numbers on this particular project here, I was actually I was planning to move my family, and we we could uh, we could we had units that were going for around you know eight hundred to at the top range a million dollars. 
um, by the time we got approvals, um, you know, the, the, the costs are passed on to the end user um, as, as a feasibility, um, as a unit feasibility exercise and, and units for no less than $2, $2 million. So this is one of the problems with the time that it currently takes in order to get your approvals with the, in, the, in the current um, zoning regime. So when we look at the missing middle, what we're thinking about is more, more along the lines of, I know some people talk about mid-rise, that's not what, what we're really considering, we're more considering duplex um, to kind of maybe around 10, 12 flex, but more duplex to four or five flex. Um, and, that, and that's within the urban core. Um, so why don't we see more missing middle? Um, I think a number of some of the colleagues talked on, talked on some of these points. Um, project feasibility, um, as, you, as you know, the values and, and, and what it takes, um, you know, they're, they're major discouragement. That's why we see investors going in and, and, and renting these, turning these units into furnished and taking the supply away. So not even a renter can come into the neighborhood now. Um, economies of scale, uh, very low margin of error, not a lot of expertise in, 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 this, in this area to create these units. Um, incentives for homeowners, um, you know, once again, we need incentives. Um, going back to the idea around affordable housing, we'll need to see you know, um, municipalities and the government step in to help with, with incentives to make these projects possible. Um, the approval process, it just needs to be faster and that's why you know, we're big proponents of, of upzoning and as of right. Um, and neighborhood pushback, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the not in my backyards, the NIMBYs. Um, that, that case in point in our particular project, that was, that was literally what caused it and you know, political issues and, and, and these types of things. So these are things that just basically created you know, massive barriers um, to entry um, for, for projects like that. And, and, and in essence, increase the price and that price gets passed on to the, to the, uh, to the end buyer. Now, partner housing, um, I'm, a, uh, I'm an advisor for, uh, for partner. And one of the reasons I was sought out is, uh, is uh, CP Planning, Cheryl Case um, is, is a friend, but also understands that, that, that I have expertise in, in, in doing this and executing real projects. This is not in theory. Um, <laughs> can't, can't, uh, can't provide investors return in theory. So we've done a number of these. We understand the challenges um, that, that, are, that, that, we, that are faced with creating this stuff. So partners kind of looking at a new model, more of a social base model um, to stand up and enable homeowners to, um, to create this, uh, this affordable product um, within the missing middle. So some of the key features that that partner model is looking at is um, the model essentially will integrate and manage the affordable rental housing development on surplus privately owned land, meaning the target market are homeowners. So they're going to homeowners um, partner will come in and essentially be your partner um, in, in the project, um, bear the project management responsibilities for design, planning approvals and construction, um, provide the homeowner options to deliver suites um, on site with hands-on development cycle support and pre-qualify affordable housing, um, sorry, uh, sorry, rental tenants um, and ensure that um, the units are affordable. So that is, the, that is the essence of the business model, how it works. What we're helping partner do is layer some technology and innovation into this um, just to um, make the process um, um, a lot easier. It'll also drive home um, data and, and, and analytics that we can, um, we can measure and improve upon. So we believe we're big proponents of innovation um, and um, that's what we believe will, will help some of our, um, some of our, uh, our solutions. So the way it works as it, as it stands, um, using open source data, we'll, we'll identify properties that, that are suitable for, for development. The homeowners will sign up on the platform, um, you know, and they're provided kind of abstract back of the napkin um, feasibility. Um, we'll then com combine that information and provide a, a 2D visual for the homeowner to show them what's possible. Um, partner will then bring in their team. Um, and, uh, you know, these are consultants, contractors, development managers, 
that will now um, you know, assist and help the homeowner create these additional units. Um, and then once the units are created, uh, partner will help um, move in the appropriate uh, tenants that, 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 would, that would be under this affordable housing um, product. So some of the, the opportunities or the, or the benefits around this model, um, you know, we want, it's about empowering the community, empowering discussion around the, deliverable, the delivery of affordable housing. Um, you know, one, one, of the, one of the main goals that, that, um, that CP Planning and Cheryl has is, is, dis, is around displacement. And, um, you know, if we, the, her idea around this is, you know, if we can understand where displacement is going to occur, um, we can react quicker and use this missing middle to, as a solution to house these, these, um, these individuals that are being displaced and quite frankly, moved out of their communities. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the ultimate big goal um, that, that, um, that, that Cheryl has and, and, and the vision um, of, of, of bringing a successful implementation with the partner model. Now this um, brings necessary resources for property owners to fill the knowledge gap in, in real estate development. So we understand as, as some, of, some of my colleagues mentioned, um, you know, there's, there's a massive knowledge gap in being able to create these um, additional units. Um, most people don't even venture to trying. Um, we wanna expedite the development process um, for property owners. Um, so that's, that's key. You can't be sitting around waiting, you know, 12, or, 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 or you know, 18 months to get permits. It just doesn't work, it ruins the feasibility. Um, property owners um, basically are enabled to democratize um, affordable rental housing. Um, and then we wanna ensure that these rental units are allocated to the right tenants. So there's some technology around that, um, making sure that the units do stay affordable for, um, for a period of time. So that in large is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the partner model. Um, definitely here are some references that we, uh, that we use for the purpose of this presentation and, and there's my, my contact information. So um, with that said, Jeremy, I'll hand it back over to you um, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks so much, Marcel, and, uh, and uh, to everyone who's, uh, who's presented tonight so far. Um, really looking forward to kind of drilling down on some of the, the common uh, threads we, uh, we, we came up with. Um, I want to start us off with, uh, with a really practical question, um, which, um, which kind of builds on something that, that, that Gord had mentioned as his, his, his reason for hope uh, around how, uh, how Missing Middle could be redeveloped uh, in, a, in a way that kind of bring, that makes these neighborhoods uh, more, more inclusive, brings in a broader mix of communities and make sure, make sure that that affordability is maintained. And that's, uh, that's the question of, of how social housing providers, nonprofit developers can be, um, can be engaged in, in the process of building this. Uh, we, we even heard examples from, from Patrick, for example, that, uh, that in cities like Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, nonprofits become are really the main way that missing middle housing end up, ends up being built. So I'm wondering if, if I can ask, you know, if I can ask the presenters to anyone interested to kind of expand on, on this discussion, like how, how do we think that different levels of government uh, could support uh, social housing providers, nonprofits, cooperatives getting involved in this type of production? And, uh, and you know, what, what limitations uh, are at hand that kind of uh, that exist to kind of scaling this up as a, as a solution in these neighborhoods? Here we go. Um, I can give it a shot. So when I was doing research, um, this is what the city of Brampton wanted to know was how they could basically encourage permanently affordable housing to be produced while upzoning uh, single family home zones. And um, the thing is, is that I, th I think a lot of it depends on what mechanism you're using to do the upzoning. And I don't know, um, I've heard a, a bit about like, we can't do zoning and conditions in Toronto unless the province uh, sets out those conditions ahead of time. I don't know if we can request what those conditions are, um, but at the moment we can't actually do that. And so I think that just the, I think to encourage affordable housing production, I think what you have to do is, is make it easier 
for affordable housing providers to produce the housing than the for-profit providers. And so what you can do is to actually, so all of these conditional upzonings that favor nonprofit development explicitly would, I think, give them, uh, it, it reduces the cost of development of affordable housing significantly. And I think that, or it should, again, don't know if that's uh, been tested. It seems to be doing that in, in the other jurisdictions, but again, haven't looked at that thoroughly. Uh, and I think that reducing the cost then makes it much po more possible. And what I don't know is whether, um, I know that Mark Richardson is on this call and I know that he has a lot to say about um, how expensive it is to build affordable housing when you don't have adequate density. Um, and so I don't know whether allowing like a sixplex is actually easier for a nonprofit provider than trying to produce an affordable housing development that's much larger in scale in another area. And maybe it makes more financial sense for them to do it, not in a single family home zone. So I think that's that's possible. Um, but I think there's like, I think there's a lot of ways, like one of the things that we don't do in Toronto, which I think is pretty strange, and I don't know why that is, is that we don't, um, do what they do in, in BC and in, uh, in Montreal where uh, strata housing. So you don't have a, a two unit dwelling where each unit is sold individually in Toronto. And that's super common in BC and it's super common in Montreal. You sell the whole house and one unit will be a rental unit and maybe the other unit is a rental or it's owner occupied, but you don't have them separated. And so if you were to have separately separate units, I think that would allow a lot more flexibility in terms of things like limited equity home ownership, where you could have a whole bunch of different single family home plots that are maybe owned by a community land trust and then uh, sold in a non-market model to different homeowners. Um, you could do the same thing with single family homes, but it's just much more expensive. So anyway, that's a, a couple thoughts. I'll let somebody else speak it. Thanks, go, thanks Melissa. Uh, go ahead, Gordon. Sure. Um, you know, I, I listened to uh, what Patrick was saying with, with real interest and, and Melissa sort of began to, to uh, respond to some of the challenges we have here. So planning law in Ontario uh, is theoretically blind to tenure and blind to ownership. So you, in, in Ontario planning law, you can't say uh, I will give extra density for this kind of ownership model. So as, as much as uh, what Patrick was talking about, I think is a very exciting thing. It would, it would take some fundamental changes in how planning law works. That's the first thing, at least here. Uh, the, and, and, and there's, a, there's a reasonable foundation for that. Uh, in the history of planning, uh, there were some very bad moments when, uh, you know, redlining took place and uh, they, you know, uh, African Americans were not allowed to buy in certain areas. That was actually a zoning law. And as a result, modern planning seems to insist that you don't zone people. So forms of tenure, uh, income levels, all of those kinds of things are not done in Ontario anyway through zoning. So that's something to overcome. A second thing that needs to uh, be seriously thought about is the business case that a not-for-profit uh, operator has to put in place depends on the rental income of the people who are going to live there. And if the people who are going to live there are on Ontario Works or the Ontario Disability Support Program or are just low-income workers, the rents they generate can't even pay uh, building and maintenance. So if there's no, like if the land is free, the business case for uh, someone providing deeply affordable or supportive housing requires ongoing income support. A very obvious and easy way to fix that, I think is to uh, fix the uh, social support system like on OW and ODSP are probably at about, at about half of where they have to be. So it's a significant increase in social supports helps not for profits to achieve that. Um, I think a final thing to, to have in mind 
is uh, this question of capacity that I mentioned. And I think a place where uh, governments can really do something is to help uh, co-op, you know, the, the Canadian uh, Housing Federation of Co-ops uh, and the various not-for-profit housing providers and public housing providers to, uh, you know, train their muscles to hire, to, to be able to hire talent who know how to do the architecture, who know how to do the business case, who know how to do the, the transactions, and who know how to do the financing. Because there, there's a huge gap there. The city of Toronto did look a little bit at trying to do that, uh, but, you know, I, I frankly, uh, we fell down on that job. As a final note, uh, what I want to caution against is um, just providing subsidy to private market units if they get additional density so that they will uh, make a unit affordable. If we, if we try to do it by giving them financial inducements, right? So with the laneway suite approval that we did three, four years ago at Toronto City Council, we said, uh, we'll sweeten uh, your application by waiving your various fees and charges and maybe providing some subsidy if you make that unit affordable. So, and out of close to 100 laneway suites that have been applied for or built uh, in the city of Toronto, exactly one of those units has taken advantage of that. You don't solve the problem by throwing money um, at the property owner as an inducement. You solve the problem by taking the uh, land out of private and speculative ownership. Let me jump in on uh, that where uh, Gordon has left off and provide a couple of case studies. I hope very briefly. One of my favorites is Vienna. I know it's far afield, but it illustrates the point. I think that Gordon is touching on and others have touched on how do you deal with the land issue because unless your land is roughly is pretty close to free, ordinary wages are not going to support the construction and the maintenance costs. That's the, that's the dilemma here to getting an affordable housing built in our current markets. Okay, Vienna. This goes back to 1920. And uh, that's a long time ago. I know it's 100 years. But what they what they did when they had a housing crisis that was way worse than ours and I, I can't go into detail about how bad it was, just take it from me, it was horrible. But what they did, the government there said, okay, the answer to that is we're, what we're gonna do is tax rental buildings really high in the property tax. And uh, uh, you know, it, as it turns out, and if you look at any uh, valuation on property, whether it's in Toronto or Vancouver, uh, four times as much as the value of an apartment building is in the land value, not in the building value. So here again, we have to really focus on land as the most expensive element in all these things. So a tax on the apartment buildings was actually a tax on the land. Now, ordinarily, uh, uh, it, and this is like a, a version of rent control, you know, it's, 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 it's an attack on the profitability of apartment units. And in our capitalist society, most people think that's a bad idea because if you do that, uh, nobody's gonna build new rental buildings. So that's a really bad idea, don't do that. But the officials in Vienna at that time didn't listen to that. They were considered socialists. So they raised taxes on the, uh, on the buildings. And what was interesting about that was they got the money from those taxes and they directed it specifically to acquiring land for nonprofit housing development. So interestingly, the fact that they've added that tax on those properties reduced the value of that land. It did uh, for the marketplace for new construction of rental buildings because the profitability was lower, as I mentioned. 
But in a fascinating way, because the value of that land was lower by their own action, they could go in with the money they gained from that tax and buy that land at the lowered value and then build the non non-private housing on it such that today over 50% of all housing in Vienna is non-market housing in a variety of forms, land trust lands, co-op, non-private housing providers, on and on, all kinds of different ways to do that, non-market housing. I only suggest that there is a global example where you use the, the municipal levers of municipal taxation, which is a power that is available, although you, you know, obvious, political complications, which I might get to in a moment. Uh, and they solved the housing crisis. And even to this day, uh, uh, an apartment or a condo in the market in Vienna is less than half the price of a condo or an apartment in places like Paris or Berlin or Milan or those other com uh, comp comparable cities. Interesting example. All right, second point. Second point, city of Vancouver. I don't know if Ontario can do this, but Vancouver basically invented the idea of a development tax that we call the community amenity contribution. It's a very weird tax because it's a negotiated tax. And, you know, much like a lot of BC politics, it's very vague and almost illegal the way it actually transpires. And I won't get into the, that issue. It may not be applicable in other more judicious uh, provinces of our country. But anyway, uh, in, the, in the period of what, where Vancouver became famous for what's known as Vancouverism, the real essence of that was the, the city negotiated with the developers, giving them additional density in return for, this is a key point, sorry for taking notes, this is the thing you wanna get a note on in return for 80% of the new value of the land consequent to the increased density. Now the density would increase by a factor of 10 or more often. So there were enormous increases in the value of that land. The city insisted on capturing 80% of that new value at the end of the project in something called a community amenity contribution for a $100 million project that could easily be $20 million or something in that range. The landowner didn't get completely screwed in the deal because they got the other 20% or a doubling of the value of the land that if it had not been upzoned at all. So they really had nothing to complain about. So all the wonderful civic amenities you see when you go to Vancouver, the seawall, the, 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 the community centers, the daycare centers, the parks, all that wonderful uh, urban infrastructure was financed from this land lift captured 80%. In recent years, because the, uh, because the uh, housing crisis back in the 80s and 90s, the middle class could afford to buy into this stuff in Vancouver. So no one was talking about the uh, crisis of affordability in those days. So all that money went to parks and cool stuff like that. But increasingly as the crisis has emerged as a, as a, as a larger and larger political issue, a bigger chunk of those community amenity contributions that presumably 80% uh, is going to housing affordability instead. Now I think it's around 25% of the CAC is typically going to uh, subsidize affordable housing. And with that money, they occasionally buy land and give it away free to nonprofit providers. I, my hope would be that they would do a lot more of that because I've done the numbers. And the value of an additional square foot of, of authorized space in the city of Vancouver is now around $800 per interior square foot, which is more than double the cost of actually building that building. So the significant cost of buying that square foot of interior space is not the building itself. It's not the permitting process, which has been discussed today, although that's a factor. Construction costs are a factor, but the biggest factor is the value of that authorized additional 
square foot of land at roughly $800 per square foot. And when the city would require 80% of that, whatever that is gonna be, you know, $600 or something like that, 650. If you add that all up to the proposed new development in the city of Vancouver, and we just had this big debate, which basically I lost. So don't get me started on that. But if you captured all that value that emerged at 80%, that would generate just in the Broadway corridor alone, which is just one example, approximately $7 billion that could be used to buy land for nonprofits along that same corridor. The rents at average household incomes would be sufficient then to pay for the building of the building and the long-term maintenance of the building and the eventual amortization of those construction costs. And after that period lapsed, the necessary uh, rehabilitation costs would be able to come out of that rent. Why am I emphasizing this, this point? It's because getting over the hump of the land cost is the secret sauce. And Vancouver has a legislatively legal authority, which has been recently expanded to the rest of the province to do these CACs, community amenity contributions at the levels that I'm talking about, 80% of land lift to use for whatever social purposes you, you determine. A couple of developers have challenged those that in the 1990s and the courts in our province have said, no, that, that's a public benefit. And the city has a right and perhaps even a duty to, to demand that as a, as, a, as a fair return for the additional land lift value that comes from those up zones. So that the kind of money numbers we're talking about here are immense and they are big enough to solve our problem. Of course, my frustration is that that has not been universally understood and my developer friends will argue against me and so will most of the people on city council these days. It remains to be seen if we're gonna, you know, eventually see it my way or not. I mean, I would say at the moment, it doesn't look likely. But I would say to you in, in your part of the world that uh, this, this opportunity to use development taxes as a, as, a, as, a, as a lever for reaching the kind of affordability objectives that we're talking about hurts nobody. It only hurts the land speculator. Thank you. I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be brief, Jeremy, <laughs> just in, 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 in my answer. There, there are a few things I, I think, um, and, and, it, and I think the, the um, the intersection of, of, of government is very important in, in this solution. Um, but um, the, the, there are a few things. Um, so for one, I would say um, timing um, of, the, of the approval process, um, that, is, that just needs to be fixed. It's, it's painful as it stands right now. And I, I get that it's a complicated matter, but it needs to be fixed. Um, expertise, I think, I think Councillor Gord alerted to that. Um, expertise needs to be stepped up within the cities. Um, we need people that have actually done this, um, done what they are approving so they understand the process better. Um, uh, expertise around urban design and planning and just looking at other cities and the way their, their, their big picture looks. Um, we need more big picture thinking and, 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 um, and expertise around that. Um, so that's a planned approach. The other thing is um, is is um, understanding innovation and really piloting innovation. So um, just really engaging and, and 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 trying that. I think a lot of people a lot of people are talking about you know upzoning and there's no data on it currently. Well, <laughs> first of all, um, a lot of this stuff is is fairly new, and the systems that most of these municipalities have may not even they may not even have systems to properly um, analyze and, 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 and measure this data. So um, so it's all about piloting piloting in, um, innovation as opposed to you know an analysis paralysis because you don't have a number that satisfies what you're what you're looking for. Um, financing incentives are are are, are always um, welcome. 
um, you know, especially if they're creative and they're matched with innovation. Um, I like the idea of the, you know the condo strata title. Um, I think I think Melissa mentioned that um, that would be a really good useful tool, especially within the missing middle, to um, to help unlock um, really innovative models, um, stuff that we're working on with 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 co ownership. Um, so that would be that would be helpful. And I and I think the the last thing um, would be. Um, concessions that relate directly to affordable housing, um, they, they do help um, as long as they're, they're, they're planned and they're, and they're worked according with the developer. I, I know personally of projects that have happened because, um, because they, they, they got that, um, that support um, by, by local municipalities. So. Oh, wow, thanks so much, everyone. That's a uh, that's a lot to uh, a lot to chew on, and uh, and some um, some optimism about what can take place. I I I have to say it, it's it's wonderful to have someone from from Vancouver here as well, uh, reminding us that in Vancouver through the the, the CAC program, um, which is a little bit like what our Section Thirty Seven program has been, that we they, they they capture and redistribute some of the the uplift that's created uh, when redevelopment takes place. Uh, the uplift grieving created by this planning decisions to to, to upzone uh, in Vancouver they, they they kind of target capturing about three quarters of that uplift and have um, created a, 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 an extensive portfolio of affordable housing over the past de few decades doing that uh, in Toronto the uh, the amount of uplift we've captured through section 37 uh, is is at most 15 to 20 percent uh, that's at most uh, and um, furthermore, through the new CBC regime, which is going to be replacing Section 37, is likely to be a, a significant reduction in the amount that's being captured. So certainly, much more we can we can be doing in this city, and uh, and uh, certainly Vancouver is not a city that's uh, you know suffered a, a crash in the production of housing because of their more aggressive approach. Uh, I want to I want to um, finish up with some questions from the audience, and I think this is a a, a great question. That, that we got near the beginning, which I imagine is on a lot of people's minds. Um, and that's, you know, that's the question of, of whether right now we have a, a, a real, if we do have a, a real supply gap in this city. Um, the, the, the question that was posted was about a, a recent CMHC report that suggests, uh, you know, by, by 2030, Canada is going to need to produce almost 4 million new homes to, to kind of, I suppose, keep up with immigration and, and housing need. You know, to what extent are you concerned about you know uh, about um, building enough to to meet this this supposed this this supply gap and um, and if you are then you know we've heard a lot of concerns that and data to suggest that like missing middle housing forms you know are not necessarily going to be producing anywhere near that amount and so should we be thinking perhaps about um, about um, doing more like a mid-rise or high-rise development in these neighborhoods is missing middle a, a bit of a red herring uh, if this is the problem we're up against. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to anyone who'd like to take it on. I'll be uncharacteristically brief on that one. It's, you know, that question comes down to whether or not you think that the problem is a lack of supply. So of course, I think it's been clear that I think the problem is not a lack of supply. The problem is the capacity, the, the tendency of urban land to absorb all the value that we collectively create to the point where the average person, the, the first, the lower four quintiles can no longer afford a housing, no matter how much supply goes in, that new supply ends up going to the top 20%. So, uh, so for me, any, any discussion about why well, we're not producing enough housing buries within it the assumption that the that if we could only add supply, affordability would take care of itself. And I do not agree with that. Yeah. If I can jump in, Jeremy. Uh, uh, Patrick, thank you for that. And also uh, thank you for mentioning Red Vienna. I actually had a bet with my executive assistant that I would be the first to mention it, but but you got there ahead of me. Um, I, I, I claim half of whatever you get. So. <laughs> I, the, yeah, we need to be producing housing. Absolutely, we need to be producing housing, but we need to ask ourselves, uh, producing housing for whom and who takes away the benefit of producing that housing? 
and the answer to those questions right now is that we're producing housing uh, for people with incomes, household incomes uh, over $150,000, $200,000 a year. That's all we're producing right now. And we're producing an astonishing amount of it, right? Like we have uh, three years ago, the city of Toronto overran the uh, steel manufacturing industry and development slowed down until the steel manufacturers could produce more. Uh, we, are about to, we are about to enter a period where we are gonna overrun uh, the, the trades. We will have, be building faster than we can hire carpenters and pipe fitters and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and CMHC, uh, has drifted from the mandate that they used to have. We should remember that uh, the federal government entered the housing uh, world uh, when municipalities were collapsing during the Great Depression. And I think this story is worth understanding. In the Great Dep prior to the Great Depression, social services were provided by municipalities and service clubs, uh, the United Way, the Boys and Girls Clubs, and so on and so forth. And when the Great Depression hit, uh, it was impossible, just impossible for municipalities and those service clubs to keep up and provide housing with, with people who had lost work and to provide meals and all those other things. So there was a white paper the federal government did uh, because something like half of the rural municipalities in Canada went bankrupt, literally bankrupt, trying to keep up. And the federal government said, okay, uh, we should take the burden of housing off municipalities because the, the property tax can't manage it. They can't manage social services and they can't manage housing. The CMHC was created specifically to uh, make sure that local governments and people who needed housing uh, received the financial support that they needed. Now it's just become, I don't know, it's, some, it, it's like list, reading CMHC stuff is like reading uh, 1990s reports from the World Bank about how, uh, you know, developing countries had to have their currency devalued and have austerity measures imposed on them, have their budgets cut. It, it, it is nonsense. It has nothing to do with the facts on the ground and who's getting housed and who isn't getting housed. Like, you know, it, if, if you're a, a, a triage nurse and people are coming into the emergency room, you deal with the people who are in the worst circumstances first, right? So our first job has to be to house something like 11,000 people in the city of Toronto who have nowhere at all to live. Our second job has to be, as Patrick was talking about, making sure that the working families who provide the services that make our cities go have housing. No amount of uh, supply will solve either of those problems. It just won't. But we're doing really well in uh, building condominium units that are owned by numbered companies and rented out to people who are in their 20s and are come from families in the top two income quintiles that's what we're building and you know like <laughs> I, I i have constituents calling me up saying look i just went to my condo board meeting and uh someone showed up and said i hold the proxy for 80 percent of these units in the name of this numbered company Right? Who are you providing this uh, all this supply for? I'll uh, I'll jump in. Yeah, I, I would I would I would agree. Um, supply is not the the only thing. I'll, I'll, I'll keep my response quite short. Um, there are there are other factors that need to be considered. Um, and in, in the bigger picture and in the, in the bigger scheme of this uh, of this problem so yeah you can't just go building supply i think one one of the the, the key things is um addressing the um 
who's who's in most need of, of, of housing and, and, and groups that have been um, left out of the equation. Um, you know, you know i.e. the BIPOC population, um, you know, those that are on the are, are marginalized. Um, so so I think I think that's that's a that's a high priority for for governments. Okay, well, um, we are, we're really approaching the end of our two hour, uh, our two hour period. Uh, I feel bad, we had, uh, we had a bunch of other really good questions and uh, we had so many good answers that we didn't get a chance to, to get to, to all the questions. But um, I, I wanna thank everyone for being here. I, I personally really enjoyed this conversation. It's, it's, great, to, uh, it's, it's great to see, you know, uh, 50, uh, 50 people coming out on a Thursday night to, uh, to talk, about, uh, talk about this problem. And uh, I, I want to say for um, you know for everyone who's who's listening, um, we, we have a, a YouTube channel uh, where we where we post all of our panel series uh, events. So you can you can see uh, this this recording posted there uh, in the next few days. You can also go back and look at uh, at our past events. Um, and uh, you know I encourage you to subscribe uh, to the to the channel. Uh, but you know for for now I'll uh, I'll just say. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks to all, all our panelists, and uh, I hope you all have uh, have a wonderful uh, wonderful evening.